everyone, tooks and jackets are out here, annual flowers are dead. We are almost ready for the winter, hope you are too. So, do you have any woodpeckers, nuthatches, titmice and chickadees that visit your feeders all winter long? Do your winter nights get really cold? Well, let's make sure we have nice and cozy places for our resident winter birds to spend those cold, long winter nights. If you don't have any nesting boxes on your property, consider putting up a couple of roosting boxes. They are slightly different from nesting boxes. First, they don't have any ventilation holes. Second, the entrance hole is actually at the bottom, not at the top. This prevents warm air from escaping. And roosting boxes also have perches. Think of a chicken coop. You know how chickens uh, climb on those perches to spend the nights? Well, wild birds do the same. If you already have nesting boxes on your property and you don't want to buy extra roosting boxes, you can make slight modification to your existing boxes to make them a little bit more comfortable. First, clean out the old nesting materials, wash your birdhouse and let it air dry. Then plug the ventilation holes. You can just take duct tape and tape it on the inside. Then if you have the type of boxes where you can remove the doors, remove the doors, flip them upside down so that the entrance hole is at the bottom. And also if you can, screw in a few uh, wooden perches. If you can't modify your uh, nesting boxes at all, that's not a big deal. Just make sure you position them somewhere away from prevailing winds, somewhere a little bit more protected and try to plug those ventilation holes because any kind of shelter in the winter is welcome. A few months ago, Doug McFudgen was watching a woodpecker at his feeders. Everything was going well. And then a few days later, the woodpecker died and he found him in the middle of his lawn. No signs of violence. So Doug was wondering whether it was just the time for the woodpecker to go. That made me think about the whole death situation with birds. So I asked Dr. David Bird to explain whether birds are self-aware, if they know when they are dying and how they actually die. Likely most humans on the planet have encountered a dead bird at some point in time. But not many of them are going to think, I wonder if this bird saw the end coming. Or, do some birds go to some special place to die when they're really old? Here's my view on it, and you'll be a wee bit shocked at the end. First, almost all birds live in fear of getting killed at any time and in any place. Especially smaller birds, which get eaten by bigger birds, not to mention by myriad four-legged predators, and of course, humans. When a bird hits a window or gets electrocuted or hit by a vehicle, death is usually instantaneous and there's no time to consider an imminent death. But some birds do get lucky in life and live to ripe old ages. In those cases, they don't go to a specific dying site, somewhat akin to elephants in their ancient boneyards. More than likely, they just find a quiet, secluded spot, safe from predators and away from other members of the flock, and just slip away. Some scientists have even claimed that the vocalizations of some species change to a mournful tone just before dying. But consider for a moment a huge avian die-off whereupon millions of ducks die en masse from botulism in a contaminated pond. They simply get sick, become weak and emaciated, and die right there in the spot. Having said that, there are some birds out there which look at a dying colleague in the flock with a totally different view. One that borders on repugnance, at least in our eyes. I'm talking about crows. These highly evolved, intelligent creatures are known to hold so-called crow funerals, where a upon a bunch of them gather around a dead member of the flock, seemingly in mourning. But according to scientific studies by crow experts, two of them good friends of mine, it has nothing to do with mourning or funerals. They're more likely gathering around with curiosity to get an idea of how the bird died so as to avoid the same fate themselves. According to a recent study, however, there's another more nefarious reason for showing interest in the carcass. It's called necrophilia, and crows have actually been observed engaging in this practice. Enough said. As for me, I'll never forget a scene in my head of one of my captive peregrine falcons clutching a live Japanese quail and plucking its back while the quail, seemingly unaware of its impending demise, pecked at nearby grains of food. It was absolutely incredible and horrible. 
So while I do agree that some bird species have evolved a certain measure of self-awareness, including their possible mortality, precious few of them deal with death in the way we humans and even our pets do. One of the most difficult things that we find this time of the year is having all the windows closed in our house. We do enjoy fresh air. So we thought we'd talk about the best, most natural air purifiers you can have in your house. They are low maintenance. They won't raise your electricity bills. They make no noise. And they are some of the best healthy gifts out there. So they are snake plants, spider plants and peace lilies. So if you don't have them amongst your household plant inventory, consider adding them. Sometime in the next two or three years, about 80 or so North American birds are gonna be declared officially extinct. Well, not the birds themselves, but their current common names. This announcement on November 3rd by the American Ornithological Society, which is officially in charge of deciding North American bird names, basically means that we'll no longer call Cooper's Hawks, Cooper's Hawks, or Stellar's Jays, Stellar's Jays. It's a decision meant to dissociate these birds from what are called problematic eponyms. For example, Hammond's flycatcher is named after William Alexander Hammond, a former U.S. Surgeon General who held the view that the mental and or physical faculties of both black folks and indigenous peoples were not much higher than those of an organ grinder monkey. There are many other examples whereupon someone currently honored with a bird name condone slavery. I was actually engaged in a Zoom conversation with over 100 North American ornithologists and birders about this very matter three or four years ago. I recall having very strong mixed feelings about it because I thought that it was unfair to take away the legacy of bona fide deserving people like George Wilhelm Steller, a distinguished German zoologist who has no less than three birds named after him. Stellar's Jay, the Stellar's Eider, and the Stellar's Sea Eagle. However, I also understand that to cherry pick the birds with human names associated with them could take years of bitter, divisive debate, and that perhaps giving the birds names that somehow connect the person viewing them with a geographical and or physical identity could help them ascertain the species upon seeing it. I don't think that's a bad idea. The Canada Jay, whose range falls mainly in Canada, is a good representation of the concept. As for newly proposed names, a good birding friend of mine came up with the name Black Crested Jay for the Stellar's Jay. Makes sense to me. It should also be noted that the Latin names will not be changed, thus preserving the legacies of deserving folks who discovered or first described the birds in the scientific literature. The really big winners in all of this, of course, will be active authors and book publishers involved with bird reference and guidebooks because these name changes, once decided upon and written in stone, would automatically mean that all of the current books on our shelves will become as obsolete as those birds' common names. Maybe not such a huge headache, consider that we're all headed towards electronic field guides anyway, and a small price to pay, perhaps, for doing the right thing in today's society. One of the summer birds that we look forward to seeing and we associated with fun times around our lake is the Eastern Kingbird. A black and white bird with a rather distinct white tip on its tail. It got its scientific name Tyrannus, which means king, tyrant, from its feisty behavior. They're rather aggressive and territorial during their breeding season. And also, if you look at the crown of their head, you will notice this beautiful reddish patch on it, hence the name the Kingbird. They prefer open habitats and water. And since we have a brook that runs through our town, we have wetlands and we have a lake in our town, we see Eastern Kingbirds everywhere all summer long. Sometime in August, our youngest son ran inside the house screaming that there is something happening on our neighbor's uh, pine tree. So we grabbed our binoculars and our camera, we ran outside and we found a family of Eastern Kingbirds, youngsters sitting all the way at the top, begging for food and adults flying to our property, picking up something there and then feeding the young. Eastern Kingbirds are totally dependent on insects during their breeding season. Adults will actually remove stingers from wasps and bees to feed their young. And they continue feeding their chicks 
much longer than other birds. That's why they don't really have much time to have another brood and their clutches are rather small. Two to three birds seems to be the norm. I will never forget the grand prize winning picture on our last June photo contest by Kathy Diamantopoulos. Kathy, I hope I'm pronouncing your last name correctly. What a beauty. Right now, you probably won't find any kingbirds in North America. Unsuccessful breeders leave their breeding grounds mid-July, and then most kingbirds are gone by first week of September. They're somewhere in South America. Right now, they'll be back here in May. Well, that's it, that's all for now. Enjoy shopping for healthy plants. Take care, everyone. I'll catch you in two weeks.